Well, I knew eventually somebody would leave the stool up here for me to stand on, so. <laughs> oh, what a, what a glorious and wonderful day it is. What I'm going to do today is a little bit different than what my notes say that I was going to do today. I'm going to talk and preach a little bit, but not not to the same extent as what the, if you look on the, the website and what's going to be posted there, it'll be hard to follow along in the notes. But I just want to share a few things. Um, I want to start by uh, by mentioning a cake. Everybody here like cake? Raise our hands. We like cake, don't we? Well, there was a there was a guy that uh, his wife was going to bake a cake, bake a nice chocolate cake. And so he thought to himself, you know, the, the cake is a delicious thing. So what I want to do is I'm going to go through because she laid out all the ingredients of what she was going to put in this cake that she was going to bake. And he thought to himself, you know, I'm going to taste each one of these individual ingredients that goes in the cake because we all know that the cake tastes delicious, right? And so that's what he does. He gets over there and he looks at it and, uh, you know, there's flour out there. So he takes a taste of the flour. It doesn't taste all that good. The baking soda, the baking powder. He even tastes the chocolate that goes in the cake. And it's, you know, not as sweet like it's going to taste when it's all said and done. But each one of it's got salt in it and vanilla extract and hot water and all those things. Tasted each one of them separately. And when he was done, he was like, this doesn't seem like much of a cake to me. But you know what? After all those ingredients are mixed together the way that they're supposed to be mixed together at the right time and the right way and placed into the oven and baked and so on and taken out, it becomes a delicious chocolate cake, right? I thought about this because when we look at the Bible, we see this as a book. Really, it's 66 chapters of one book. It's one narrative. It's one story. But when you break it down individually, some of it you're like, why is this in here? Why do we need to know this? Why is this, you know, we got Sodom and Gomorrah, we got Noah, we've got Enoch, we've got you know, stories about Israel and wicked kings and, and you know, all kinds of atrocities and things that take place. How does any of this have anything to do with the, with, with the story, with the narrative? And individually, when you look at it from that standpoint, some of it doesn't make any sense. But when you put all of it together, all the ingredients together of what God was trying to say, to us and to humanity, it becomes a beautiful story. It becomes a story that's enveloped in love. It becomes a story of people who got lost along the way and of the God who searched out. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, it was God who went in there and calling out to them. They weren't out there looking for God saying, well, we messed up, you know, let's talk to God. No. God was saying, Adam, where are you? They were fearful. They were hiding from God. But God had a message for them. And it was that even though things didn't look all that good at that moment in time, things were going to get better. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard the term proto-evangelion. Probably don't use that in a sentence very often this week, did you? Let's talk about the proto-evangelium. Well, Genesis chapter 3, at the end of the events there in the Garden of Eden, and when God talks to Adam and Eve and tells them the consequences of what took place and what happened when they had eaten of the forbidden fruit and so on, he gets to the serpent And God makes this proclamation here, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. 
God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking to the serpent and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That verse is called the Proto-Evangelion because the Greek word is a compound word. It means first gospel, proto Evangelion, first gospel. This is God's solution to the problem of what took place there. There was going to be the seed of the serpent over against the seed of the woman, and thus the pageantry of redemption begins. It wasn't that the whole thing took God by surprise. He wasn't caught off guard and said, well, what are we going to do now? No, these things were all in order. God knew what he was going to do to restore what was being lost and to, and to recover what had been lost along the way. When we, when we look at the redemptive story, what we realize is that the first 39 books of the Bible are the time of promise and of prophecy of how God was going to work this out. The last 27 books, the New Testament, are the realization of those promises and those prophecies. Everything that was said in the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New and in connection with those things. And so all of redemptive history is bound up in that brief verse there about in between, between the serpent seed and the seed of the woman. When we look at how this was going to take place. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Like I said, I'm skipping around quite a bit this morning. I don't want this to become a long, involved thing. We'll come back to it some other time. But in the prophecy given here in Isaiah 9, beginning at verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now, who's that talking about? Well, we understand that's talking about the coming of Jesus into the world to be the fulfillment of what was promised all the way back in Genesis 3.15. God was working this out to help recover what had been lost. And then we come over to the New Testament. I want us to think about this for a minute. You know, Matthew, the gospel account of Matthew talks a little bit about the birth of Jesus and his coming into the world and how those events took place. It's interesting. Picked up something at Walmart this week, and it was supposed to be a decoration for this time of the year. It was supposed to say Noel. I opened it up. It said Leon. So I had to take it back. <clears throat> Okay, when it gets to the birth of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 1, it talks about the fact that Joseph was betrothed to Mary. Betrothal during this period of time, we think of these things like engagement, but it was more formal than that, and it would last for a period of a year, but they didn't come together in intimacy during that period of time. But technically, they were Married, they were betrothed to be married. And so in Matthew, we have the account there about the coming into the world. It says, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They'll call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. It goes back to Isaiah chapter 9. You'll be called the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. But let's go to Luke for a minute because I want to think a little bit about this. Luke chapter, well, there's a lot here that could be said. 
Let's read in Luke chapter 1 real quick here. The promise that was given here when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary. Verse 31 says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and shall bear a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And then we go a little bit further in the story of the account there and the fact of what was promised. But let's look at Luke chapter 2, verse 1, beginning. It says, It came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. That verse is a key verse there because... It says all the world. Is he talking about Australia and New Zealand? And, you know, no, it was the Roman world that was under consideration here that was being registered under the authority of Caesar Augustus. But notice that this census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the household or house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So here Mary and Joseph travel to that area there to be registered according to the decree of Caesar. Now, keep in mind that Joseph and Mary's relatives were there also because that was their city and that was their lineage and that was where they were from. But notice here what it says. It says, verse 6, So it was while they were there, the days completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, cloths, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, think with me here for a minute. If Joseph and Mary and all of their relatives had to go to that one area to be registered, according to the decree of Caesar Augustus, there were other family members right there with them, right? Why didn't Joseph and Mary stay with their family why did, why, did they have, why did Jesus have to be born in a manger, in a stable? Why did they have to have a room at the inn? See, the Bible doesn't give us all the details, but if you think about this, Joseph and Mary were betrothed and she was found to be with child. I don't think those relatives wanted to be around them because it was disgraceful for a woman to be pregnant and not be married in that sense. And so that Jesus had to be born in a stable, in a manger with the animals. You know, we we think about these events and what took place at this time in history. And the Bible like the ingredients to the cake doesn't give us the full picture all in one place of how these things work together. But there was some suffering that went on because of how this had come about. I mean, Mary could tell, I mean, even when Mary told jo- told Joseph in the beginning that this angel had appeared before her and told her that she was going to be with child and that she was going to give birth to Jesus who would save his people from their sins and so on. Joseph was like, eh, I'm not sure about this. This doesn't sound like a story I can believe. And he was going to put her away privately according to Matthew's account. And so God sent the angel to Joseph to confirm that in fact Mary was telling the truth and that she was going to give birth to Jesus, who would be the only begotten Son of God. You know, we don't get all the details here. It doesn't give us all those details, but we can think about it. 
and realize that it's not just the great, big, wonderful, smooth story that we always sort of painted out to be. There were situations that were going on. There were These were people. They were just like us. If this had happened today, they'd have been on Maury Povich and say, Joseph, you're not the father. Right? The reality is that God was working something out that had to be done separately from the normal natural process of conception and birth because Jesus had to come as the last Adam into the world to save his people from their sins. He had to be different. He left heaven to come down and do that. And so we don't always see the pieces or the ingredients of the cake separately as being that tasteful. But man, when they're all put together, it just, it amazes us to see how God worked all of these things out. Now the seed of the woman, according to John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now there are some people that say, well, Jesus didn't really exist until he was actually born. No, it says he was in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So his preexistence was long before the time he was born in Bethlehem. Matter of fact, on one occasion, John eight fifty eight, he said, Before Abraham was, I am. So there were some amazing things about Jesus that we have to see. And we have to understand so many people at this time of the year, and I love the songs that we sang this morning. So many people argue about, well, you know, Jesus wasn't born at this time of the year, blah, blah, blah. We've all heard that, right? Shake your head this way. I don't, the, the Bible doesn't tell us the exact date of when Jesus was born. The important thing is that historically speaking, you can look back in history and find that there's plenty of evidence that he came into the world and that he was born and that his presence in the world has affected all of humanity everywhere. And so whether he was born around the time of the Feast of Tabernacles or if it was later in the year or when, it doesn't matter. At this time of the year, the whole world pauses for a moment in time which is amazing because the world doesn't pause hardly for anything. But they do pause and remember, you know, Bethlehem. And they remember the events that took place there. You know, they don't get it all right. You know, the how many wise men were there? We have no idea. They had three gifts, but we don't know that there were just three. And they didn't come till later anyway because Jesus was in the house by the time they got there. What about the shepherds? Well, the shepherds probably, it gets cold in Palestine. They probably wouldn't have been out tending to their flocks in the middle of the winter time in December. So maybe he was born a little earlier. Doesn't matter. What matters is that we recognize the fact that he was born into the world. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We've all heard John 3.16. Do we realize the significance and the power of that? The things that I wanted to get to today that I'm not going to get to today is talking about the pageantry of what God did to bring this about. And I'm going to get to that in next week. So if you're here this week, and I don't get to that this week, then you have to come back next week. (laughs) But what I wanted to say about this is that there is such a beauty in seeing what we see and knowing what we know because of God and what he did on our behalf. The story of the Bible is about three things. It's about number one, redemption. It's about number two, reconciliation. And number three, it's about restoration. The three R's, redemption, reconciliation, and restoration. 
And if we believe and put our faith in Christ and we obey the gospel and become children of God, guess what? We have redemption, we've been reconciled, and we've been restored. Everything that was lost back there in the garden with Adam and Eve, the enmity that was between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman has been taken care of. You know, we, we look at the world and we think, well, it's still kind of a mess out there. And yeah, it is. But we have a message that's not just based on, well, if we don't fix things, God's going to, you know, squish everybody and, and there'll be divine punishment in that way. That, that's not the essence of the message. The message is that God loved you enough to fix this and he's got a gift that he wants to give you if you're willing to accept it. It's not just about, well, I'm scared of God. You know, the, the divine judgment's coming to squish all of us. No, that's not the message. The message is that God loved us enough to fix this so that we can step into his presence and enjoy that and experience the power of that presence in our daily lives. And we can have an influence in our home, in our towns, in our cities, in our nation, and in our world for good. And so that's where we stand today. And that's the message that we, we have to take and that we understand. When, when you look at the totality of God's word, it's like that cake. It's not the individual ingredient. It's the totality of what it says and the totality of what God has done on our behalf. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you loved us enough to send Jesus into the world to be the Savior, to provide forgiveness, to bring us out of death and into life, to bring us back into your presence. We thank you for that. We pray that at this time, as we spend time with our families and as we go about our daily activities during this time of the year, that we would always keep in mind your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and your love for us. And help us to reach out and to minister to people around us who need to hear the good news, the gospel, the good news of what Jesus did on our behalf. We thank you for these blessings. We thank you for your presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, if you need prayer, if you need some help in learning about how to become a child of God, if we can help you in any way, that's what we're here for. We're here as a community to love one another and to care about each other. We're not perfect, but the author of this book is, and I trust him, and you should too. If you have a need this morning, won't you come while together we stand and as we sing?